Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask the Expert event today. We're going to be learning about the American Civil War with expert Kenneth Wong Wong Suichanalai. I'm Craig Lamald. I'm your host for this afternoon's event. Thanks to everybody that's joining us today, including our Beacon Circle members. We really appreciate your continued generous support. And we also want to thank our partner for this event, the Massachusetts Historical Society. Before we want to get before we get started, I just want to give a um, reminder that unlike us. You're not going to be on video. We can't hear or see you, but we do want to know all your questions. If you have a question you want to ask our expert, all you have to do is open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. Uh, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from. Um, so please, when you submit the question, let us know where you're watching today's event. If you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, and this is important, please give it a thumbs up. Those ones rise to the top of the list. And we're going to make sure to get to all the ones that have the most uh, thumbs up votes. So please thumb, uh, give, it, uh, give it a vote. Uh, also, if you'd like to turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you're gonna get two different options. We recommend subtitle uh, that enables captioning at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> and you can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open up where you can see what each speaker is saying. <clears throat> Please bear in mind, excuse me, I'm losing my voice as I say this. Please buy, bear in mind the closed captioning might be a little bit delayed. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Candace Wong Wong Sui Chan Lai. Uh, Kenneth Sorn is the director of research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. He's the author of uh, this book, Northern Character, College-Educated New Englanders, Honor, Nationalism, and Leadership in the Civil War Era. Uh, he's the co-editor of So Conceived and So Dedicated, Intellectual Life in the Civil War Era North. Um, and he's uh, author of the forthcoming Wars, Civil, and Great, The American Experience in the Civil War and World War I. He co-directed the National Endowment for the Humanities-sponsored project West Texans and the Experience of War, World War I to the Present, while an associate professor of history at Angelo State University. Uh, so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Craig. It's an honor to be here. Happy to talk with our audience about what I think is the most important period in American history. Yeah, well, I think we have a huge audience here of people who are really excited to, to learn from you about this. And I just wanted to start off with a couple of quick questions before we get to the q and I think that, you know, living here in the Boston area, when we think about Massachusetts, I think people tend, their mind goes to the Revolutionary War, right? Um, but people from this state played a significant role in the Civil War, too. Can, can you speak a little bit? About, I mean, and that's what you get to in, in this book how important Massachusetts and the Massachusetts people were in that conflict. Absolutely. Massachusetts leads the way in many ways. It was, of course, the home to uh, many of the leading abolitionists of the time, which led to the American Civil War, but probably one of the greatest wartime governors, civil wartime governors in the nation at that time, Governor John Albion Andrew, was in charge here. And it is because of him that Massachusetts troops were the first ones to arrive in Washington, D.C. to help def defend the nation's capital right before the fighting really got going. Massachusetts politicians, uh, soldiers, uh, you name it, were everywhere. Massachusetts punched above its weight, you could say, in sending troops to the Civil War overrepresenting many other states. And um, also, don't forget, we had a lot of people who joined the Navy and served on the high seas and on the riverfront as well. And the people from Massachusetts, I mean, when you focus on this book, we're talking about a lot of very educated people in Massachusetts who didn't necessarily have to go and fight, but chose to, right? Can you speak a little bit about that, about why the people of Massachusetts, or at least the people you write about in this book, chose to, to go and, and take up arms here. Absolutely. So that book was a product of my dissertation, and it uh, asked a simple question, basically, which is that why would people who did not have to go fight in what would turn out to be the single bloodiest conflict in American history do so? Why did they volunteer to do so? Basically, if you graduated from a college or a university in the 19th century, you were part of the top 1%. You were going to become an attorney, a professor, an, a merchant, you name it. You're uh, in an upper class, uh, in essence. You could have bought a substitute. You were, there were ways that you did not have to go risk your life on the battlefield. This very quickly became a very bloody conflict, as people realized. 
So why would they do this? Why would they volunteer to do so? So the cohort I study goes beyond Massachusetts. It's really about New England college students, those who went to places like Harvard and Bowdoin and Amherst and Yale and uh, Wesleyan and places like that. Why would they do so? And it boils down to, or at least I argue, uh, that it comes down to this sense of uh, character. This is the northern variant, if you will, to what is much more popular in American history, American cultural history, which is this idea that there is southern honor. Everyone knows about the duels and the culture of dueling and all of that in the South. And my question was, is there no such custom in the North? And if you look at college students and what they're writing and what they're talking about, I argue that there is. And it's a very much internalized vision of what one should do. You do what is right, not necessarily what is popular. And to these young men who were actually, can you believe this? They went to college and they actually internalized and believed the lessons they were learning. Um, they thought it was absolutely their duty and important to their character to fight in the war. Real quick, one of the uh, the key class that these uh, college graduates had to take before they left colleges during the 19th century was a class called moral philosophy. Hmm. We would call it ethics today, a philosophy class. At the time, moral philosophy was generally taught by an institution's president, and it was basically supposed to provide a moral compass. You're about to become the most educated people in the United States of America. Yeah. What are you gonna do with that knowledge? What is what what should you do with that knowledge? And the idea was that they should do what is best for society. And during the Civil War, we see that they volunteered in large numbers. They died in large numbers. And it was because they truly believed in what they were doing. Do you see any parallel today to that or contrast with with what we see today with young educated people <clears throat> devoting themselves to, to to causes? I mean, is that is that character lost? I don't think the character is necessarily lost. I certainly think that there are many temptations um, in choosing one's path today. I was in yeah. the classroom for 10 years before coming here to the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I can say that the young people today are certainly have a lot of the good spirit. They have a good desire to do what's best for the world, to make a better world. But then again, they're met with a lot of realities and checks as in, well, how am I going to feed myself or take care of my family and whatnot? Craig, actually, I think you told us a, a, a neat story about when you were in Connecticut. Uh, would you like to chat yeah, about that real when quick? When we were speaking before, I was saying that um, I, I used to be a reporter in Connecticut and there were protests at Yale University um, by students protesting other students going into fields in, in finance and, and going to, to work in, in those areas rather than devoting themselves to things that would make the world a better place, uh, things like climate and, and, and other topics. Um, so I think there is actually um, a, a movement to, to try to do that. And I guess, um, you know, as I'm hearing you speak about the, the temptations, and of course we do have those today, those, those Civil War, uh, you know, era college educated People must have had their own temptations too, but but they chose to, and oftentimes sacrifice their lives in order to to defend the union. Absolutely, I mean, some of them were part of the leading families of the time, and what you see when you look at their correspondences with their parents. For some of them, there's a lot of debate about what one should do. Their parents will say, well, we sent you to Harvard or we sent you to uh, Yale so that you would not have to go fight in the infantry on the front lines. And the student, uh, the, 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 their children will write back and say, but this is the fight of my generation. What am I supposed to do if I'm not uh, out there leading folks, making the case, make, making the argument to others, leading by example, yeah. that the union is worth preserving and our family is going to be on the front lines of that. Okay. You know, I wanted to ask you also about the current project that you're working on, because I think, I know when I think of the Civil War and World War I, they feel like two very different eras of American history. But you say that they're really they're not so distant after all. That's the great experiment with this book. I was in charge of uh, putting together a series of programs to mark the 150th of the American Civil War from 2011 to 2015 when I was a faculty member. And immediately after that, we picked up uh, with a series that commemorated the 100th anniversary of the First World War. And you start thinking about this and you say, well, that's 50 years. Uh, 
folks who uh, remember 1972, that's not too distant. Tens of thousands of people were still alive when World War I started who had seen and fought in the American Civil War. In fact, in 1915, there was a parade of about 30,000 veterans trying to recreate this grand uh, march, this grand parade from 1865. They're still very much alive. Their senior statesman, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., a name that would be very familiar to folks here in New England and, and, and in American history, was on the Supreme Court at the time. Two of the great leaders, important leaders in American society, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, General John Pershing, both of them were children during the Civil War, but they certainly remembered uh, events from the conflict. They remembered events from their childhood, and they very much took these lessons to heart when they were in charge of leading the nation. What so the were those lessons? Here, like how did, how did the Civil War inform what happened in World War One? Well, sometimes they learn the right lessons, and sometimes they don't learn the the, the right lessons. We have uh, this is a co-edited volume, so it's uh, several scholars who have contributed to this. They're comparing topics of uh, military leadership, of political leadership, of medicine. Uh, one example is that um, our medical facilities were actually much better during World War I, great modernization of, and scientific uh, implications or applications, rather, of the knowledge applied from the, learned during the Civil War to World War I, setting us up for this major conflict. Mm -hmm. That's not quite the case when it comes to trauma and understanding uh, psychological trauma. There was... Um, still an understanding that if someone suffered from what they would have termed in the World War I period, shell shock, that that was a, something that, would, that, that was something wrong with the inherent quality in the interior quality of the person rather than they've just experienced a really horrific event. Mm. So there are lessons that they learn and don't learn. Another important one is about what to do with veterans. Before the American Civil War, there was a very small budget in the federal government. That changes after the Civil War as politicians uh, are funding pensions for United States troops, veterans of the Civil War uh, in, in, who had fought for the Union. And this increases the cost to the federal government a great deal. By the time of World War I, those politicians think, well, we're not going to do that again. We don't like this. There's, there's, there's room for corruption. It's a waste of money. And so they attempt to cut off funding uh, these soldiers when they come home from Europe or from other parts around the world. They don't want to go down this road of paying uh, for pensions and whatnot. Well, uh, as it turns out, that was not the uh, necessarily the best move, as we see um, by uh, the bonus march. Folks may be familiar with the bonus march in 1932, when veterans of World War I marched on Washington, D.C. and asked for payment uh, for their service during World War I. This was because they had been they had not advanced as uh, financially as those who had stayed on the home front. And mm. that led to a whole conflict. Then you get the GI Bill after World War II. So it takes several generations sometimes for a society to learn a lesson. Yeah, we're not always quick learners, I guess. No, we're is, not. Is the point. It takes it takes some time, <clears throat> but we learn by looking back, by by looking at the history. And that actually brings me to uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about. Be before I do, real quick, actually, I just want to remind everybody: if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A chat. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, and then also upvote the ones uh, that you would like answered. And we're going to get to those in, in just a moment. I just wanted to ask one last thing w about learning from history and about, I think, how we interpret history and, and use it. Um, because I think the Civil War feels relevant today. Um, and I'm sure you get a lot of questions about, about this, how, how the Civil War resonates today. I mean, um, you know, we've seen the Confederate flag paraded through the halls of Congress uh, on January 6th uh, during the insurrection. And and I think um, you, there's a lot of talk about how America is more divided than ever. You know, I, I hear that phrase a lot um, on NPR. And and I think, well, <laughs> is that true? Because we fought a civil war. Um, how do you see the legacy of the civil war and how the, the narrative of the civil war has been sort of adopted in, in different ways? And, and what does it mean to us now as we face really a very divided country? That's a really great question. That's a very big and broad question, I would say. 
Civil War is not the only time, of course, in American history where the nation has been divided. Vietnam was another period. There were uh, the civil rights movement. You can think of many times when this has happened. Yeah. The war, of course, is, and as a civil war historian, I'd say it's always relevant to think about this uh, conflict. But, and I would say that this question has come up a lot in recent years about whether or not we're headed to another civil war. I get that all the time. Mm. Are we? I would say that historians are not very good soothsayers. We don't tell the future. And it's it's and so that's not going to be my department. I would say that there are certainly areas of concern if you one compares what happened in the lead up to the American Civil War and the present day. And one has to do with the political system. The American political system has a release valve. Every two to four years, there's an election. This is what people look to as a time and opportunity to change course if they disagree with something. And when people question the fairness or the justice of that system and start to question whether it's the best way forward, then there's room for a considerable amount of trouble and danger. So take, for example, the lead up to the Civil War. In the 72 years between George Washington's elevation to the presidency and mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln's elevation to the presidency, people who were slaveholders, people who were from the South, or Northerners who sided with the South on multiple issues, uh, controlled the presidency for about 60 years of that period. Wow. The 12 years uh, of the presidency, the two Adamses from Massachusetts, for example, um, they're certainly Northerners. Um, this Many Northerners at the time saw this as inherently unfair, that their population was growing, and yet their influence in the federal government was not uh, corresponding with that. The, the Southerners, slaveholders, had a majority in the Supreme Court that entire time. And so fast forward to our time, and you can see a lot of uh, discontent at times when the national mood does not necessarily fit with national policies. Mm -hmm. Twice in 20 years, we've seen the winner of the uh, Electoral College lose the popular vote and assume the power. So people start asking, was something wrong with the system? Why is it that one party gets more votes for congressional members, but is still in the minority or minority in state governments as well? So this is certainly a, a, a moment of concern when the when 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 the politics and the political machine that we have does not necessarily represent the society. So that's what I would say about uh, similarities. Now, if people are fretting about whether or not you're going to see Napoleonic armies like we did in the 19th century, that's all gone. That got left behind by World War I. Mm -hmm. But I would say that folks who would like to learn more about how the past may influence the present, I would say skip ahead a little bit. Stay in the Civil War era, but look at Reconstruction. And what you had during Reconstruction is probably more likely to happen, which is you had roaming bands of terrorists, uh, people trying to influence political elections to oppress uh, voters and whatnot in the American South using terroristic tactics of, of, of small groups and whatnot. And that's more likely to, to be the case in uh, in our modern world. So take a look at Reconstruction, a period that is not given sufficient um, concern or thought, I think, in American history. Well, that's sobering. <clears throat> look, th but but there's good news, all right? So there, there are two constants in history, I would say. One is that change, uh, change, change happens. Second, the past is um, is not necessarily a predictor of the future. Yeah. Agency, what we do is really important. Agency is critical. Consequences of, of, of the past can certainly live with us, but we're not bound by them by any means. I think that it's easy to say that we should learn from the past to understand the present and whatnot. That's fine. Uh, learn from the past, be informed by the past, but don't be bound by it. That the future is for us to write. And just because it took place in the past doesn't mean it has to happen again. And that's coming from a historian too. So there, there you have it. Um, we have a, a lot of great questions. And so I want to jump ahead and, and just get into that list now uh, because a lot of people would like you to address um, uh, some wonderful questions. We're going to start with a question from Kate, 
who wants to know, was there universal support for the union cause in the North? Or were there folks who either opposed the war as pacifists or as supporters of slavery and the cotton economy? Oh, absolutely. There was a good deal of dissent. It's, it's tempting to think of the North as a unified whole. And it's tempting to think that uh, the South was a unified whole. Neither of these is true. Um, what you're dealing with is a society, a democratic society, a democratic republic that's waging a civil conflict. And democracies are messy. There's debate everywhere. There was a very strong opposition to the waging of the civil war in the North and not just in uh, places in the Midwest where there was more traffic and commerce and whatnot along the Mississippi River, but in places like New York City, in places like Boston itself, there were those who supported the uh, system of uh, the economic system that was in place. Yeah. I think we all know that Massachusetts certainly led the way in industrialization, in making sure that uh, the raw materials of cotton produced in the American South got turned into clothing and whatnot. That made a whole lot of fortunes for folks here. And so there was certainly a divide between those who wanted business as usual, who were okay with the oppressive system of slavery, um, and those who said that uh, this was not okay. We think of the North, we think of Massachusetts as the home of abolitionists. Abolitionists never made up more than 10% probably of the population. They were just extremely vocal wow. in making their case. And so there's a good deal of dissent um, in the North. There are riots that take place. The, the New York City draft riots are well known, but Boston had its own uh, riot uh, led by folks who were very upset about the draft. You know, draft that takes place in, in during the Civil War is the first in American history, as well as the fact that the war becomes one about emancipation. And there's a good deal of racism uh, and, and, and distrust of free people uh, everywhere as well. So uh, no, there's a good deal of dissent uh, here in the North uh, in, in cities like Boston too. Okay. And, uh, and likewise in the South, right? I mean- yes. um, not, it wasn't universally uh, supported the Confederacy either. I could... No, it's certainly not. And when you're talking about Southerners, remember there are white Southerners and there are black Southerners. Southerners. So certainly people who were enslaved, freed people, the freed population of the South, and also there was stronghold for white unionists, mm -hmm. those who lived in the mountains, uh, for example, who were not as reliant on the system of slavery. People in East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, I'll point out that uh, West Virginia broke off from Virginia to form its own state of unionists during the war itself. So the Civil War is a very fractured landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's seen on both sides of the Potomac and the Ohio rivers. Yeah, the ideology is not separated by the Mason-Dixon line by any means. We have a question from Chuck in Dorchester who wants to know what role did Massachusetts mariners, fishermen, smugglers, sailors, for example, play in the war? Well, Massachusetts, of course, has a very proud maritime history. Massachusetts sailors were important to the whaling trade, the whaling industry. That was certainly a casualty of the American Civil War because of the raiders, Confederate raiders that prowled the high seas, that destroyed ships and whatnot. So Massachusetts has this tradition of seafaring. And when the United States Navy needed uh, those uh, folks to help expand the, 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 that wing. We'll point out that the Navy at the time was a puny, puny force, uh, probably no more than 30 ships, and it quickly grew to hundreds of ships. Um, they needed people who knew what they were doing, and Massachusetts supplied many of these. Massachusetts also supplied much of the new innovations when it came to waging war on the high seas, the development of monitors. These are iron plated, uh, steel plated vessels that are out on the oceans and whatnot. Um, they came from uh, places all along the coast. So Massachusetts um, was certainly a leader in that area as well. I don't think people think enough about what the Navy did during the Civil War, both on the high seas and on the rivers, but there's a lot more literature to be written on that. Okay. Um, question from Carolyn, who a uh, really interesting question, wants to know, do you see any parallels to poor Southern white people supporting slave owners, uh, the 1% of their day, and the support for the 1% by white people today? 
I, I, I suspect that there is some parallel to be made there. Um, you've raised a very good point, uh, certainly, about slaveholding in the American South. One would think that slaveholding would be much more prevalent in a country that broke off in order to maintain it. Let's be clear, the Confederacy did that. That's the very cornerstone of their being, that slavery was the cornerstone of their being. But only about a quarter of white Southerners were slaveholders. And the vast majority of those, 90% of those, own no more than five individuals, the big planters that uh, are, are romanticized in these lost cause narratives and whatnot. They were a very small proportion. And yet, why is it that the Confederacy, those who lived in the Confederacy, white Confederates, were so determined to maintain that system? Right. It's more than just economics. It also has to do with race. The South is based on, uh, at the time, uh, was based on, of course, this uh, system of racial hierarchy that even though one could be a very poor white person in the American South, they knew that their social status was higher than every single African-American in the South. So there's a racial boundary that's there. There's a, the idea of slaveholding as something to aspire to um, in, 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 in the same way that uh, folks certainly aspire to climb the economic ladder today. Yeah. It all gets tied up. It's money, it's race, it's uh, social forces and culture that are, are, are all connected here. I want to follow up with something you just said, because about this war being about slavery. Yes. I think, you know, we hear sometimes that it, oh, it was about states' rights, mm -hmm. right? That that was what the that was what the war was about. Right. And that it wasn't truly about slavery. And I, I guess I wanted to ask you about how this the Civil War is cast today and and um, and how t it's taught today. What it truly was about? Do you do you feel strongly one way or the other about about how it's being taught? Has it been misinterpreted through the years? Well, Craig, as a good reporter, you always ask the follow up question, right? About state rights. State rights to do what? To do what? And the answer for the nineteenth century, of course, was the right to hold enslaved laborers. The answer for the mid twentieth century was the right to segregate. These are ways that people talk about an issue as a way to elevate them without necessarily going to the heart of the matter. Education certainly has come a long way. Historians have done a lot of good in helping to unravel these, um, these misconceptions, to challenge them uh, from the 1960s and 70s to the present day. I think we're in a much better place and people have a better understanding of this. But of course, old ideas die hard. And the concept of state rights um, is certainly something that is hard to get rid of in American history since it is very much part of uh, a majority not necessarily controlling a minority in an oppressive manner it goes all the way back to the Constitutional Convention and all the compromises that took place there. Um, so it, when you wrap it around a concept like that, that you try to rally folks around, that's, uh, there, there's certainly some element uh, there, but um, always ask the follow-up question. What's really at the heart of the matter here and what right exactly are going to be infringed? We have a question from Beth who says, <clears throat> I'm currently researching the vehicles Northern females created during the Civil War to exhibit patriotism that wasn't necessarily recognized at the time by the U.S. government, such as the women who did not formally participate in the USSC. Might you have any comments on that? I think that that's a wonderful project, and there's a whole lot of new scholarship that looks at ways that people contributed to the Civil War uh, effort um, without necessarily being recognized. We have a brand new book that's out by the historian Jacqueline Jones, um, who's uh, talking about the role of African-American labor during uh, the Civil War in the Boston area. It's a great uh, book. I would recommend that Beth contact us here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. We have a wonderful team of librarians who are able to help uh, navigate. And I'll make a plug that we have 14 million manuscript pages and counting from every period of American history and thousands of collections, as well as artifacts that can really help folks get a better sense 
of the past. What a great resource. Thank you for, for recommending that. I'm well, sure. I mean, if you'll let me, I, I, there are also really wonderful items that folks should see here relating to the Civil War as well. And I think it's easy at this time when history has been so politicized that it's hard to know who the authorities should be, what, what it is, and what one should do with it. And I would encourage folks to come and look at the real deal. Look at the blood-soaked letter of Wilder Dwight, a Harvard graduate who wrote his last words on this planet to his mother while dying on the field of Antietam. We have that letter in our collection. Wow. Come look and touch the pen that Abraham Lincoln used to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. We have that in our collection. The sword that Robert Gould Shaw let, used and led the 54th Massachusetts with on that fatal day in South Carolina. We have that in our collection. I think that history, if you want to think about it theoretically and philosophically, is nice and all. There's nothing like seeing the real thing to touch history, uh, in fact, and to be inspired by it. We're free and open to the public, and we love to share our stories with you. That's amazing. I'd love to do that. Thank you for recommending that. And I'm sure a lot of our uh, people who have joined us right now uh, are, are making plans, I hope, to, to come and, and actually touch those physical objects. That's incredible. A question from Stuart. Great question was to say, um, can you comment regarding the role of Massachusetts, really Western Massachusetts, he says, as the armorer of the Union with rifles from Springfield Armory, and I believe cannon and sabers from foundries in Chicopee. Absolutely. Massachusetts uh, led the way in, in many ways as well. Look, it, 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 Massachusetts it was a leader in industrialization. And here's one statistic that folks like to, um, well, I certainly like to talk about it when I was in class, but it certainly gives I, people uh, an idea of the scale here. The Confederacy, when it started out at the 11 states of the Confederacy, had about 100,000 industrial workers. The northern states, had 100,000 factories and places. That's just the difference here. And a lot of those places were in Massachusetts. Place, um, and Massachusetts, of course, with its armory, its well-known armory, certainly was instrumental in supporting uh, the, the war effort. There were factories that used to produce cotton that were certainly shuttered as a result of the war, but Massachusetts also clothed a whole lot of people with the woolen industry and whatnot, the uniforms that soldiers wore. There was a lot of innovation when it came to canned goods and other supplies that the Bay State provided. And Western Massachusetts does not necessarily get enough credit uh, when it comes to uh, the war and what they did. A lot of folks also crossed the border into New York. Massachusetts was um, all uh, very supportive of the war. And when the regiments here in Massachusetts were filled, a lot of them crossed the border, went to Connecticut, went to New York, went to places like that to volunteer. So it's not just the material that the state provided, but also the manpower. Okay. I love this question from Rachel from Wellesley, um, because you were talking before about that letter, that uh, the bloodstained letter that was yes. written. And so much, I think, of what we know about the Civil War comes from these incredible letters that went back and forth. And Rachel's question was, how is the mail delivered to soldiers in the field? How do I find information on each company or regiment? It's the most literate army in existence up to that time. Uh, the uh, the American people at that time, both in the North and in the South, uh, knew how to read. They didn't necessarily know how to spell correctly, but they could certainly write phonetically. And this was the pastime. This was the major event that soldiers were waiting for in camp, which was the delivery of the mails. Yeah. And if you're interested, come and look at all the letters and envelopes that we have here at the Massachusetts Historical Society sent from the front, uh, sent to the front lines. And you can see the envelopes, how they're addressed. They're addressed to regiments. They're addressed uh, to specific campsites, and then they're distributed from there. The how is it done? Like how do they how do they get in there and out? And I mean, is horseback or? Oh, it's it's certainly horseback. I mean, that's the regular U.S. Postal Service, U.S. Postal Mail. And then, of course, there are special delivery uh, services. The Adams Express, for example, was one way that uh, people could get um, items shipped to the front lines. It, that company later on became uh, 
bit of a gruesome business because they were also shipping bodies back from the front lines uh, in order to be buried as well. But there's certainly an infrastructure here. The regiments, you remember, um, are usually raised within communities. So everyone knew each other. Um, you, you were you were in the unit with your neighbor. You were in your new unit with the, the 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 county you were from and whatnot. And so it was easy enough uh, for the mail to follow along with where everyone went. The newspapers were also very good with reporting. Sometimes the military leaders didn't like that quite so much as reporting to where every unit was. But um, certainly the system uh, was uh, was was in place to be able to deliver this. Doesn't mean the mail didn't get lost uh, from time to time. This is why some soldiers got into the habit of numbering their letters and saying, well, what happened to number three? I wrote you three, four letters, and you're only referring to those two. So it's not foolproof, but um, it's certainly there. There's really wonderful research that's being done on the uh, early part of the uh, the United States Postal Service and how that spreads uh, literature and knowledge nationwide at the moment. And she also had a, a follow-up question, which is how to learn about individual regiments. Um, do you know how she can research that? Absolutely. So regiments had regimental histories. The, this is one of the plus sides of being a literate society and also a very vibrant veteran community after uh, the Civil War. They are widely available in local libraries. The Boston Public Library has a solid collection. The MHS has a wonderful collection. But I would start with these regimental histories. If there are uh, GAR halls, Grand Army of the Republic Veterans Halls in local communities, sometimes they'll have that too. But these were very widely popular at the turn of the 20th century. These veterans coming back to recount their old war stories, to create lists, definitive lists of who was serving where and when. Um, And these are just wonderful resources for folks to track down individuals as well as the service of people from a specific area. So certainly um, come to us, uh, contact your local library, and that's a great way to start. Great. Terrific. Thank you. So many fantastic questions. Thank you for all of your questions. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. I want to just take a quick moment to introduce my colleague, Liz. Hey, Liz. Hello, and thank you everyone for spending some time with us alongside our special guest, Dr. Wong Shui Swanaway, who is taking this special time to discuss the history of the American Civil War with us today. For decades, GBH has told stories that matter to you, connected facts, revealed truths, and brought stories to you that you need. GBH is there for you every single day, ready and energized to engage. And today we're asking in return for your support to GBH with a donation of support. Today, if you are able to give $7.50 as a GBH sustaining member or make a one-time gift of $90, we will send you a book from Dr. Swan Shui Shanale's Northern Character, College Educated New Englanders, Honor, Nationalism, and Leadership in the Civil War Era. To get this book and to donate, it's super simple. Just go to gbh.org slash support events. You can also text GBH to the number 800 800- Two zero four three eight one one. All this information will be found right in our chat tab now. I know we say it a lot, but it's only because it's so important. Everything you count on from GBH, from programming, podcasts, news, investigations, and everything in between, all relies in turn on your support. So if you were able to give today, please go to that link now. If you're already a member, thank you so much for being here. Now I'll turn it back over so we can continue our great discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liz. Really uh, appreciate it. And and thank you to everybody who's who's supported GBH. It really does make it possible for us to have conversations like this one and everything we do on radio and television as well. So thank you very much. And it's pretty great that actually, uh, if people do donate now, they can get this book. I, I got this and I've been reading through this. It's wonderful, Dr. Walter John Jolly. It's, it's really fascinating history. Um, and so glad that uh, people can uh, can get it by making a donation. Now, I want to get right back into these questions. We have a great one from Sharon who says, I live in West Texas. And I'm wondering if your ten- tenure at Angelo State gave you any insights into the Southern perspective on Northern character. That's a wonderful question. Uh, Thank you for joining us from West Texas. It is a vast and beautiful part of the country. Uh, And I learned a lot about American history um, 
uh, uh, there, uh, primarily actually about the period after the American Civil War. There are legends in West Texas. There are a lot of great legends um, because of the vastness and the rural nature of the place. One of the legends is about how John Wilkes Booth, after he assassinated President Lincoln at Ford's Theater in 1865, apparently was not captured and killed by Union cavalry in Virginia, but moved out to West Texas to become a high school teacher. Um, another variant of that story is that he moves out to uh, Oklahoma. Uh, but um, I think that tells us something about the role of the West. And the West is so absolutely essential in thinking about the coming of the American Civil War and what happens afterwards. The Civil War may have been fought in a simplistic manner between the North and the South, but it was very much about the West. And that's one reason why it was so absolutely devastating. The nature, the future, the course of American history in the American West um, was at stake. That's why the conflict came over barring slavery spread into the Western territories, not the end of slavery, not emancipation, but rather the blocking of this system of labor and racial control moving into that region. So the West is absolutely essential here. I think the West is a great place to see the metamorphosis and changing nature of American culture after the Civil War. In the South, before the war, of course, this is dominated by a system of honor, as we talked about, this uh, code of ethics or, or, or conduct that people used, and um, in the North uh, as well. What people were trying to get at, really, as America changed in the 19th century, was how are you supposed to tell truth from fiction? How are you supposed to tell someone who claimed to be something um, whether or not that was truthful or not, right? So someone can walk into a town and claim that they fought in the American Revolution. They could be lying. There's, there's no the evidence we have today to, in fact, even if we had evidence today, that's not necessarily a best way of vetting someone uh, or mm -hmm. people don't necessarily do the best job of vetting someone's uh, credentials. Um, but this was certainly a very big issue during the American Civil War. And what you see is people from these cultures of the South and the North also going to the West reinventing themselves, right? It's a, it's, 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 it's a frontier. It's a place where one can leave everything behind and really uh, embody an individualistic uh, sense of oneself. There, uh, the great historian Heather Cox Richardson at uh, Boston College has written about this. Several of her early books are about this mythos of the West and how it affects the American psyche in the period immediately after the American Civil War. It's a place of um, innovation. It's a place one can get lost. It's a place where one can reinvent oneself. It was why people fought and it was worth fighting for, for that reason. So interesting, thank you. Um, Vicky says, I was surprised that so many re-enlisted after having been in the war for many bloody battles. Can you speak to that? There's a camaraderie, there's a bond that soldiers developed. Uh, when they served together in a unit, they, many of them, despite having seen the worst that war could produce, uh, still, when it came time to re-enlist, felt that they had a job to do, and they had a duty to finish the mission, to complete this task that had consumed the lives of their friends, their neighbors, and the people they fought next to. And so there's certainly this element that is absolutely critical uh, to explaining why so many did that. People don't realize this, perhaps, but the American Civil War continues to be the single bloodiest conflict in American history. Right. It was uh, the total, the death toll from the American Civil War, anywhere between uh, 700,000 or 750,000, was equal to the casualties the United States sustained in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam combined. Wow. Do, do I understand correctly that it's, it was 2% of the population? It was, a, 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 yes, a, it was it was actually a larger proportion of that of the population that died, and especially if you're thinking about uh, the two societies in Wajam. So, of course, the South um, suffered a considerable, uh, considerably more casualties from mm -hmm. this. 
one, 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 another way to look at this, the Battle of Shiloh, which takes place in April of 1862, yeah. um, it's the first major bloody battle that Ulysses Grant fights. When it was fought, it was the single bloodiest battle ever fought in North America. Um, so it, the total casualties from Shiloh equal those who fought uh, from for, it, the United States in the Revolution, from the War of 1812, from the Mexican-American War, all in a single battle of two One days. battle. One battle. By the end of the American Civil War, Shiloh ranks, I think, seventh in the, the bloodiest battles. So this was an absolute bloodletting. And you could certainly, you would not fault people from saying that they've had enough of that and gone home. Yeah. But they well, certainly- It seems like, why would anybody- who survived something like that ever go anywhere near it again? But they did, didn't? Like, how many did reenlist? We have a sense of a lot of people who kept going. Well, um, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head the exact percentage. There was yeah. certainly a lot. Now, the, the trick here is that if you were uh, a soldier in the United States Army, you had the chance to enlist. If you were a soldier in the Confederacy, there was no option. You were in it till the end of the war. The Confederate Congress very quickly passed laws that pe prevented people from leaving uh, once they had signed up. Even though they'd signed up for three months or nine months or anything like that, they put in stopgap measures to prevent that because they would have melted away. The army would not have been able to sustain that. Um, so uh, the United States soldiers uh, had this option. Many of them did sign up. Another way to think about this is how many of them voted to sustain Abraham Lincoln in office in the election of 1864. They voted in large numbers for the continuation of the conflict against ending the war quickly because they believed in the mission that they still had to accomplish. And um, by that point, by that point in the war, it, there was a mission that also included emancipation, the destruction of slavery, as well as preserving the Union. Um, <clears throat> question from Nancy. We were talking about, of course, the educated people from the North who, who participated in the war. She wants to know, was there a parallel role for uh, and a commitment of educated women during the Civil War? Yes, absolutely. Now, the problem is that many women who were educated were not treated equally, were not allowed into organizations, even those who volunteered for organizations like the United States Sanitary Commission, uh, places like that. They were certainly not given the same leadership roles as men. There, um, this is an age where there are certainly some female colleges and institutions, some of them uh, places that are co-ed are there as well, but the proportion of edu college educated women is certainly not the same as would uh, take place in the decades after the Civil War. And after the Civil War, you see this desire for women who have graduated from college to do something good with that knowledge and not just be someone who gets married and stays at home. This is where this uh, the field of social work, the progressive movement, the attempt to better life in big cities comes in, Jane Addams and individuals like that. So I, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I would say that in the period after the Civil War, we see uh, young women who are highly educated attempt to channel their uh, knowledge into forces of social good on that front. Um, question from Paul who says, what was the effect in New England and, and on the U.S. on the loss of so many well-educated leaders? Was there a brain drain? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I guess it's hard to say what it would have been like if those people hadn't had been alive, right? You can't, right. You can't sort of prove the negative in, in a way. Yeah, that's hard to say um, as to what would have happened. I think... Certainly, on the cultural landscape, there was a greater sense of understanding the cultural loss. I mean, Memorial Hall on Harvard's campus, Memorial Drive, Soldiers Field, you think of the geography of Boston, of Massachusetts, all the statues all around the yeah. town commons in every corner of New England, and you can see the loss. Um, that communities sustained, I think it certainly had the effect of tying people, cementing people more to the Union, to the United States for which these individuals fought and died. And of course, the price that's paid 
by the leadership class, along with every other class of individual here, was a testament perhaps to this new vision of America that was if certainly no uh, paradise where there are no classes and class structure, but certainly one where the elites certainly uh, bore their load as well. And not just in living on the home front and providing support financially, but also sacrificing their own blood and kin to the conflict. <clears throat> okay. Um, question from William uh, asks, how do you best explain that slavery was the cause of the war, but the war was not begun to abolish slavery? I mean, Lincoln said that he was not fighting a war against slavery, right? Right. That's an absolutely wonderful question. And that goes to the heart, not just of why the war turned out the way it did, but why the memory of the war has certainly shifted and changed from 1865 to the present. To be, let's be frank, the United States Constitution protected the institution of slavery in the lead up to the Civil War. It is not until the passage of the 13th Amendment the, uh, outlawing slavery in the United States um, that uh, that changes, right? So we are a slave-holding nation. If the war had ended before the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery would very much still be alive to this very day. Folks have always been fascinated by this asymmetrical nature of the conflict. So the Confederacy comes along and says, well, we're going we're gonna to go off and form our own nation. And uh, it, we're going to have as its cornerstone slavery. Slavery is going to be explicitly protected. Now, in the United States Constitution, slavery is danced around. It's not mm. actually directly talked about, but there are a couple of places where it basically protects the institution of slavery. The Confederacy doesn't do that. The United States, um, and certainly Lincoln's concern, is with this so-called border states. The border states are slaveholding states that remain loyal to the United States during the American Civil War. They did not join the Confederacy. Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, for example, are these uh, border states. Lincoln can't have these states going. Kentucky has lots, lots of horses for the United States Army. Maryland, if it goes to join the Confederacy, where's Washington, D.C.? But in the middle of a foreign country, which cannot happen. There's a good deal of politics that's involved here. So Lincoln is absolutely adamant in early on making the case that what he's doing is protecting the union, the union only, and not slavery, not the destruction of slavery. Remember, he's not an abolitionist. Lincoln is anti-slavery. His goal is to prevent slavery spread into the American West, not to end it where it is. Mm -hmm. This changes the bloodiness of the war. The, and by the way, Lincoln attempts time and time again to coax Southerners to come back. His goal is to end the war with as little bloodshed as possible. Right. He tries to offer purchasing uh, enslaved laborers. There are attempts to say that uh, a constitutional amendment will be put in place that specifically says that slavery will be protected forever uh, in the United States. He's willing to compromise everything here. None of that brings Southerners, uh, white Southerners, secessionists, back to the table. And so wars have a way of spinning out of control. And the bloodiness of the conflict um, and, and the change to emancipation is a result of that. Lincoln has to, in essence, up the stakes. He also needs manpower. The Civil War would not have ended in the United States victory if not for the 200,000 African Americans who fought in Union Blue. They fought in the Navy, they fought in uh, the Army. The first unit raised in the North, of course, is the 54th Massachusetts, the statue of which is right across from our state house in, yeah. on Beacon Hill. But this is, um, there are, there's a lot that's go, that goes into this shifting nature of politics uh, of the conflict. Yeah, wow, okay. Rebecca asks, how much of our division today stems from the Civil War? I think a lot. Um, history is always contested. The nature of history is that it is constantly written and rewritten. This is certainly something historians do. We expand new areas, new approaches and whatnot. We explore new questions. If, if, if there was no contest in history, then 
Well, why, why do we need multiple books about it, right? So we're always looking at something new. So history has always been a battlefield. And I think one of the key issues that led to the failure or the challenges of reconstruction and later on into the uh, period of this, this dominance of the lost cause, where, where you get this idea that the Civil War was all about state rights and nothing more and what that, that comes from people compromising about truth and history. Historians want to get at the truth. Truth doesn't always dominate. What we know, what is spread, what people have this knee-jerk reaction um, and response to of, oh, it was about state rights, that's myth, right? A lot of it is myth. It's a lot about what people think is there. And after the American Civil War, there's more or less a compromise in how we understand the past. The historian, the Yale historian David Blight has written about this, um, that in the period of the 1890s, right near the turn of the 20th century, when the Civil War generation was getting older, they basically compromised with each other. And this is a period that some historians refer to as reconciliation. What could we reconcile? What can we agree uh, on about the past that would unite the country after this absolutely awful bloodletting of the Civil War? Well, they could agree on the bravery of soldiers on both sides, white soldiers on both sides. They whitewashed history. They wrote African-Americans out of the narrative. So it made it easier to deny them rights. It made it easier to strip them, uh, strip them of civil rights in the post-war period. And people, so instead of saying the war was about slavery, they said it was about state rights. They said it was about this constitutional issue that could not be resolved. Um, this, is the, this is a perversion of the truth. This is a compromise in order to establish a narrative that people can live with and continue on. Some people could live with it. Majority of people lived with it, but it was never the truth. And it took another hundred years, really, before historians um, came to this realization. Now, African-American historians knew this from the very start. W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who was trained here in Massachusetts, of course, is one of the leading figures at the turn of the 20th century who challenges this narrative and says that you should never forget that slavery was at the absolute heart of the conflict. So I'd say that um, what we deal with today is still this blended myth um, bits of history sort of sprinkled in right there. But mm -hmm. what you really want to get at is uh, away from those myths. What you want to get at is the real truth. And to do that, you go back and to look at the sources or come look at the sources here at places like the Massachusetts Historical Society. See right. what the times were really about. That's the cure. That's the cure for myth. That's the cure for misinformation. It's truth. There it is. Um, uh, time for, I think, for one more question from Catherine from Boston asks, she said, so many of the one percenters, so to speak, in the 18th century were enslavers. Did their descendants who fought in the Civil War thoughtful at all, were they thoughtful at all about their own families or Massachusetts slaveholding in what would still be the near past? Uh, now, is this, this is about uh, Massachusetts families who were- Yeah, the, I think the descendants of slaveholders, you know, how, how did, I think people come to- come to terms with that? Were they thoughtful about it? How did they? That's not exactly my um, area of expertise. I think that it really depends. It depends on uh, the family, where they were, how much land, how much, and how many enslaved laborers. I think we've seen more of that in, the, in, 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 in recent decades of people realizing the toll and the cost on African-American populations. Um, and I really, I, I, I'm going to punt on this one. Okay. Um, well, we have another, we have, we have tons of great questions and we're only going to get to some of them. So I'm going to just jump right in with Teresa, who asks, can you talk a little bit about the women who disguised themselves as men so they could become soldiers? <laughs> yes, this is, um, this is, uh, uh, these are wonderful stories that take place. There are, are, are many uh, in both the Confederate and in the, uh, in, in, in the Union armies where there are women who want to be part of the action, who are either following a loved one or want a sense of adventure and want to be part of history, who cut their hair, who are fighting in the units alongside uh, men. Uh, there are, there's a wonderful book 
I believe about this uh, by an historian named Elizabeth Leonard. Uh, she recently retired from Colby College in Maine. I think it's called All the Daring of a Man. And I would recommend that as this wonderful collection of stories about women who did just that. Hey, that's a great recommendation. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have uh, we've run out of time. We have so many fantastic questions. I'm sorry to everybody who's watching that we couldn't get to all of the great questions. I think we we could probably have this conversation all afternoon, and I would love to do it. Uh, unfortunately, we have to run. But um, Dr. Kenneth Thorn, Wall Street Channel, I thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. I'd encourage people to contact us. You can write us at the Mass Historical if you have any other questions or we can continue the conversation. And I will leave you just with another thought, which is, again, be informed by, but not bound by the past. Absolutely. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. And please come back and join us for more events like this. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you.